Hello, my name is Sam Dunn. I'm a long-time film fan um, with a special interest in this era of British film, um, the late 60s into the early 70s. Um, and I'm delighted to say that I am joined by the director, writer of the film, Dick Clement, uh, best known perhaps as being one half of what is possibly the longest running creative partnership um, as writers for TV, film and theatre uh, with Ian Lafrenet. Hello. Hi. Pleasure uh, to be here. Very good to have you. So we're watching your film Otley and we start in the Portobello Road. Well, let me say something about this shot. I'm quite proud of it, actually, because it was quite difficult. It's a long tracking shot through uh, Portobello Road on a, 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 as you can see, it's pretty crowded. And you'll see in a moment, um, we, we're in a van. That's a moment there where Tom is seen by one of his friends who has no idea that he's acting, but Tom stayed in character and acknowledged him as if it was somebody that he'd just seen in his milieu. But this, this is supposed to be Otley's base anyway, because he, you know, he, he, he knows something about antiques and he occasionally nicks the odd one and tries to make a profit. He's on his uppers. When the whole story, of course, is he's, he's the innocent spy or the innocent guy, rather, who gets involved in espionage. And um, when we, Ian and I wrote it, we, we very much identified being devout cowards ourselves. We thought that we could identify with... Uh, with Otley's character as being somebody who would not behave particularly well and in, in the situations that we were going to put him in. So this is a pretty long shot and um, all those people are real. I suppose these days you'd have to get uh, clearances from all of them, but in those days, if any of them wanted to get charges for it now, uh, it's a bit late. <laughs> so quite guerrilla style, sort of post new wave. Yes. Yes, it's yeah. a long shot, but it's it's really good, and uh, I was very pleased that that we got it. Um, and uh, I, I, this was the first film I'd ever directed, so mm -hmm. I was incredibly green. Mm. Um, you know, I, I I was quite surprised when we were shooting outside to find that they wanted lamps in the open air um, because I hadn't done that in television. I, I'd done television before this, um, but nothing. Um, on this scale. Mm. So I got the job by basically asking for it. Oh, really? Well, it, it, halfway through writing it, um, I threw my hat in the ring and the producer, Bruce Cohen Curtis, it was his first film too. And um, so he, 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 I got the job. I was in Hollywood for the first time on a visit when I heard I got the job and I was very thrilled. And um, because we, we were both virgins, as it were, um, they, they assigned us Carl Foreman as a sort of godfather to the film because they, um, they thought that they needed an experienced hand somewhere in the background. And Carl was great, uh, and he made one very important contribution. I'll, I'll wait until later when it comes mm -hmm. up, but he made... We went to see him in his office. We were very impressed because this is a man. He had a picture of himself with uh, Winston Churchill on the wall behind him. And we were very impressed. And halfway through the meeting, he was leaning back in a circular, in a chair on wheels. And it tipped over. And we didn't want to go forward and draw attention to the fact that the great man had fallen on his back. And then we realized that rather like a beetle, he couldn't get up. He was like a beetle on his back. Oh so we had to help him. Um, so all this is, is, uh, is uh, my friend Barry Fantoni, um, who I'm still in touch with occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, the, all this stuff is, is selling the idea of Portobello, which really still looks, apart from the cars, very much as it did then. And when you say selling, do you mean with an eye to the American audience? No, I just meant uh, in, in, the, in the, the, the sense of the director um, establishing the milieu. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it was it, it, Alan Parker said something to us when we did the commitments, which he said that um, sorry, there's James Bolam, who yes. of course was in the Likely Lads, indeed, um, uh, which was the first thing we ever did, and um, that's Fiona Lewis. Um, Alan Parker said that a film should establish its milieu in the first five minutes. 
uh, and the tone of what the film is going to be. Because mm -hmm. we'd written a, a sequence in The Commitments which was um, in rather a pretty part of Dublin. And he said, no, no, it's too pretty. That's not what this film's about. And he immediately moved it to something in the middle of it. Anyway, that's a different movie. But mm -hmm. I think in the same way, uh, this this was establishing me earlier. Now, this is the first scene I ever shot. Mm. This is absolutely me on day one as a as a director. And I, this is uh, James Villiers coming in as one of the two villains. And... Um, that, that, that was a, a pub, I remember, and I wanted to do a zoom shot, which is coming up in a minute, between one bar and the other. Mm -hmm. And um, so I still remember the, uh, the experience of my first day as a film director, which was exactly this, this sequence. And so the various camera moves we're seeing here, the, you know, the pans, the zoom that will come up, are they your idea? You had to get into a mode of thinking quite visually, or were you working very closely with the cinematographer? Well, uh, it, it was definitely my idea. This is the zooms coming up mm. in a minute. Um, it was very much my idea, but I discovered very quickly that, you know, I knew nothing about lenses, for example. Mm. Um, not really. But the crew were great. And the, the first thing I realised I had to do was get the crew on my side. And um, they were wonderful. And, and I, I, I found very... Uh, very quickly that if you were particularly in a set on location I would be standing in one corner and I'd suddenly notice that the the DP and his uh, operator were in, were in another corner and I I wondered why and then I went and looked at it from their point of view and realized that they had a better point of view than the one that I was planning so I, I think uh, I'm very much a believer as a director in um, welcoming uh, you know, collaboration from the crew and getting their mm. their help mm. because without it you're sunk. Mm. So um, that was that was the whole idea. And in terms of then the visual style, because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of interesting shots with, that include bars. This idea of entrapment is quite interesting in the film. I think there are lots of things that are going on. They very seem very uh, important, perhaps, to understand what's going on. That's all there in your script, or that's happening as you're shooting and blocking and so on? I think it was mostly in... I, th I think we had worked out most of the stuff in the script. What is, it, what is again, quite unusual about this film is that... Um, it, it was a tight script, and I think the first assembly was 98 minutes, and I cut five minutes out. Wow. That, that's about all. Gosh. Um, which was quite economic. Mm. Um, this is one of those party scenes. These aren't. These are never easy. Trying to get um, just the right amount of dialogue, um, that, that, so that you. Yes, this is Jonathan. Uh, forgotten his second name. Bless his heart. Um, we gave him a very good line, um, and, and I. Uh, I think the line was, he's either dead or terribly well, I really can't remember. <laughs> That's right, yes. But, but I, I remember saying to him, you've only got one line, but it's a very good line when I persuaded him to do the, to do the part. This, this whole scene is full of very witty one-liners. The Antonioni one coming up is, is, is very funny. Thanks. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, it's a, it's a hugely kind of choreographed sequence, isn't it, this one? Yes, um, yes. Both with moves, uh, delivery of lines and... And the revealing of various different people, including, in a moment, Romy Schneider. Yes. How yes. did Romy come to be involved? Well, I, I, I'll be honest. I, I had... Uh, the, the, the studio had a deal with Romy, and they, they cast her. And she's lovely and wonderful. Um, but I, we had written an English girl. Mm -hmm. we, we, in a way, wanted her to be... I actually approached Charlotte Rampling, who didn't want to play another bad girl. Mm -hmm. um, but... It, it, you know, she, she, look at her, she's gorgeous. Mm. Um, but by being sort of continental, she fell slightly for me into the, the standard spy mode. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we'd deliberately written an English girl. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, once we had her there, um, she was, you know, she was great. And uh, by the way, let's say something about Tom. Uh, I felt incredibly lucky to have Tom... Um, in the lead of my first movie. And he could not have been more cooperative. 
and easy to work with him. And he was a great team player. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was a joy working with him. Um, and not in the least bit starry. You know, not in, it, it, he was absolutely on my side from the beginning. So um, that was great fun. And he really does have some great expressions, in the, it, yes. visually, facially. He, he does a lot with his face in this film. It's really rather a joyful watch. He's great. He's mm. great. That was Edward Hardwick, who I'd seen. I had seen him do a flea in her ear mm -hmm. um, at the National. I was very, that, very impressed with him in that. He's about to die in a minute. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yes, Tom was absolutely great. So just to pick up on what you were saying about um, sort of spy narratives or, you know, tropes of the spy um, sort of film or story at that time and the, the sort of international intrigue part that you thought that Romy Schneider maybe falls into a certain cliché or trope. Were you, were you kind of aware of the various uh, films that were being made at the time? I mean, was this film made because there was a bit of a, a sort of a penchant for spy thrillers at the time or was, did, it, did it have a different impetus? I can't tell you whether um, we got the, you know, whether it was because spy um, films were popular at the time. Mm. But our intention certainly was to um, to be sort of the anti-spy film yes. in a way by by making him an anti-hero. You know, not not a, not brave. I mean, he's he's not. Um, the Ipris file, you know, he's, that's not who he is. Yeah. And he's certainly not James Bond. Yeah. Um, and, and we thought that gave it, uh, gave the film a comedic twist, um, which I still think it is part of its appeal, mm. that it's, it's very possible to identify with Otley because of his situation. I mean, he is literally the innocent mixed up in, mm. um, in Daring Do and... Uh, Intri intrigues. This is Gatwick. And I, I, am I overreading it? Uh, if I do, I take it too extreme. If we look at him, I mean, he's the heavy man. He's the unhero. He's all those things. There's a, there's a class consciousness at work in 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 the film, isn't there? Yes, there, there, there is. No, there is class consciousness in it. I mean, he's. You know, he, he's a bit of a rogue too, mm. Hartley. I mean, he's mm. he, he, he's not above lifting things and, yeah. and, and nicking them. This, this is Sheila Stiefel on the right, who again played a part with no lines because I thought this was a funny joke. And she was, <laughs> she was very agreeable to doing it. And uh, it's an outrageous joke. And I, I, I think it was when I looked at the location and I saw that sign yes. that, the, that the gag occurred to yeah. me. Yeah. But, I mean, bless her heart, it was, the, the, those were two very good actors, not extras, you know. But, but uh, it was wonderful to be able to get good actors to do something like that yeah. because you wouldn't have got that from mm. extras. And uh, I was very grateful to them for that. It does at the, one of the same time. It stands out as being quite different to the rest of the film that moment because it is almost like a sketch. Yes, yes. Um, but it, but it's incredibly funny. Yes, it's very funny. Now this is Richard Harris's son, ah. who's become a film director himself. Um, he wasn't directing films at the time, as you can see. <laughs> um, he was he, being obnoxious. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And um, Phyllida Law uh, is uh, Emma Thompson's mother. Um, a wonderful actress. I mean, I, I felt very, very fortunate in having such wonderful actors in all these parts, actually. I mean, because there's a, there's a lot of, you know, supporting parts. And it was very important to have um, uh, um, have the best possible... I, I'm a great believer in casting the best possible people you mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. in every part, mm. you know. I mean, just give yourself, do yourself a favour and get good people. This was our idea that he was halfway through a shave. Yes. Um, which sort of pays off later. And um, just before we leave the scene and he goes to the door, um, the art uh, direction is incredible. The colours, um, again, just to go back to the idea of working with the best people, the crew, there's some very good people working on this film. Well, let, yes, let's talk about the art director. She was Carmen Dillon, mm -hmm. who did Henry V, mm -hmm. among other things. And... They introduced me to her very early on, and um, the first thing she said to me was, why do you want me? I've been doing this since Noah was a sailor. <laughs> and 
she, she was very self-deprecating, but she was absolutely wonderful. And particularly for a first-time director, I knew at once that uh, she was completely in my corner for the whole movie. And, um, you, you know, if, if there was a, a budget problem or anything else, she was on definitely on my team mm -hmm. and, and backing me up all the way. This is Ronnie Lacey, another mm -hmm. actor I worked with and had a lot of... Uh, regard for with his, um, with his burgeoning flu yes he sne sneezing later don't we yes it, it no Carmen w was superb I, I worked with her subsequently when I directed a stage play mm -hmm. um, and she, she was the designer on that too and that's Frank Middlemass now curiously this is a set you would have there, there are some anomalies in the film mm -hmm. in that there's a couple of scenes that you would have thought would have been better on location. This is one of them. Mm -hmm. I remember the floorboards creaked like crazy when the camera moved over it because we were uh -huh. on a sort of dais. And then later on, we shoot on a houseboat and that's the sort of set you thought would have been better off building because <laughs> it was see. incredibly cramped. Uh, but I can't remember the, why those decisions were made, but they must have been to do with budget. And, um, you know, all the, t all the time we were fighting um right not not fighting i mean it was it was a normal sort of budgetary restriction but people mm -hmm. were, were very aware of budget mm -hmm. so and but we didn't go over i think we were bang on time pretty much and how did the producer work with you was he very hands-on very present or yes bruce was was around most of the time um carl foreman stayed in the background mm -hmm. um and until his key note, which I'll come to a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, there's a line in this scene uh, where, where Otley says, uh, will this take long because I've got my driving test coming up? And what is interesting is that when we wrote that line as a complete throwaway, we were not at the time setting up the, the scene later in the film. How interesting. But it was, it was lying there... Um, and later on, I'll tell you, I'll save what Carl said for a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, it, it was wonderful to find within the text the seeds of something which turned into mm -hmm. probably the best sequence in the movie or, or the most memorable. I think it's the one that people do remember. It's certainly the most original take on the car chase that I've ever seen. Yeah, it, it, it played well too. Yes, you know. oh, absolutely. Um, and so, uh, so talking of text then, can we talk about the source? Can we talk about Martin Waddell's novel and the series? Yet we were not nuts about the novel mm. um, because it, it, it seemed to be a bit all over the place. And the plot, I, I, I think I remember not understanding the plot quite. So we, we felt that we had to simplify it. And... Um, and, and also, you know, adapt it pretty freely, which we did. Mm. At one time, we thought of calling it Otley Pursued, but I think everybody thought that was slightly, you know, not quite right. Mm -hmm. It's not bad, though. Mm. I don't hate it, but it, um, I, don't, I don't know what they called it in France. I can't remember what they called it in France. Um, but, yes. And so the business of adapting the the novel how long did that take and where did the idea for that come from well again it was it, we were approached mm. to, to to do the screenplay mm. i mean over the years we've um, we've, we've written screenplays from many different ways i mean we've done original screenplays we've adapted novels and and you know there is no one fixed way what you, uh, I've often wished that we could, uh, we've always wanted to do Le Carre, for example, because we're, we're, it's a very different kind of spy film, but we love Le Carre dearly, and we've never been able to do one. But it, it, it seems to, to have great source material, and that is a great boon. Now, we have that with The Commitments, mm -hmm. where The Commitments is a, a fantastic book with wonderful dialogue. We had there. Our job was to give it um, better structure, and uh, and really find a, more of a spine. Mm 
uh-huh. for the film. But the uh-huh. but the dialogue was wonderful, and it was there, and um, you know, so th- there are, and we've written original screenplays as well. And the one I'm most proud of is maybe um, Still Crazy, which is one about a band getting back together. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, there's Romy. She looks very nice. Yeah. And so again, this camera work, these setups, this is all very much you relying on the brilliance of the crew to realize the ideas. Yes, I mean, what is also, it, 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 that's true. But when we do come to the car chase, um, these days, all those car chases, the car is always on a low loader now. Mm-hmm. And nobody's doing any driving. We didn't do that then. So that I was driving when I was getting the shots of of tom and you, you know it's it's like i was in i had to be in the car somewhere so otherwise i couldn't tell what the hell was happening but we we did you know that's a real car and real yes. driving yeah. that, that's happening and and tom was actually driving in the um in the car chairs as well this is a golf course i think they weren't too pleased about cars going across no i can't remember where it was and um, uh this the villain there's a guy called Robert Brown John, the guy pursuing them. Mm-hmm. He was a famous um, art director. I think he, he, he did a lot of credits. Uh, he was not an actor at all, but we we thought he looked um, like a very good heavy. Yes. And he liked the idea of playing a heavy, so that's why we cast him. He's got a very nice sort of understated delivery as well. Yes, yes. And so we're starting, obviously, to get into the intrigue. You know, Otley's life is being turned upside down, having you know, been a fairly free and easy guy walking down the Portobello Road. You know, obviously, he was getting turfed out of his place, so that's a problem. Yes. But now he's knees deep, isn't he, uh, in what would appear to be a world of international intrigue. And That's right. That's right. This is where we upset the golf club, <laughs> yes, I think. Yeah. Um, You'll see in a minute uh, when when this car when it ends up in Knightsbridge, what is amazing to me when I last saw the film was how empty the roads are. I mean, we shot in Knightsbridge um, up here. Here mm. it is, and I don't think you could do it now. Look at that; it's empty. I mean, it's, and it's it's. I mean, I, I was able to get this set up by sticking a van behind it. So I, I don't think I had to shoot that in the middle of the traffic by very carefully putting a van yes, behind it yes, that, very good. that yeah. masked it off. Uh, oh, is, that, is, is that still true? Yes, I think that's still true. Um, and then we went to this shot, which was from the Scotch House, I think, something mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, again, it's, uh, it's, it's, he's not even a very good driver, as you can see, which is... <laughs> Look, obviously setting up what's happening later and he's just stalled the E-type. Um, There's some great sort of social um, record in, in this film, isn't there? Great capturing of London of a, of a yes, period. Yes, yes. Well, obviously Romy is foreign, but, mm. but uh, Jimmy Villiers, um, I think Jimmy was about 26th in line to the throne, actually, so he was extremely posh. This is James Maxwell. Um, this no. is definitely a film that I think people would call nowadays modish. Does that does that feel painful, or does that does that work for you? I mean, and also when you're making a film like this, presumably, is or, or rather is the intention to do something that is kind of pop in terms of its day. Well, I don't think it was a conscious. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think I thought it through mm. that much. I mean, it, as I say, I was very much flying by the seat of my pants, if that's, I think that's probably a bad, a mixture of metaphors, but <laughs> um, I'll, well, anyway, I've stuck with it now. Um, but we wanted to put London on the screen, certainly, yes. and, and we wanted to wanted it to feel as contemporary as possible and as real as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of go against the, the conventional kind of hero that's that's the main yes intention but the capturing of as it were the sight sounds and possibly even smells of london of the time is that something that bruce as a producer did he did, was there an eye on the international market especially the american market well our, our, our producer is american yes um 
so yes, I mean, certainly all the time we were... I mean, this is not long after all the nonsense about swinging London. So in a way, London was extremely modish at the time. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, we were riding that wave. I mean, it, at, at the 60s was a time when it was relatively easy to get a deal to make a movie in, uh, in London. With American money. Yes, yes, because because London was on the map, yeah. so that that didn't hurt. Mm. Now, I think I made one mistake here, which hit me later on. Um, in this sequence, I wish I'd given him a change of wardrobe, because he's been wearing this now for quite a long time, and I think if he'd borrowed a sweater or something, this is one of those thoughts that I had in post-production, mm -hmm. it would have been nice just to ring the wardrobe changes, because he doesn't really change until later on when he gets to the... Um, the Hilton Hotel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the Playboy Club, I think, actually. Now here, this is a real houseboat, Gosh. Um, not a set. And as I say, this, this would have been easier to build in many, many ways. Um, it was incredibly cramped, as you can imagine. I, I, there's one shot, too, where I, I insisted on the camera um, doing a 180. I'll see it in a minute. Mm -hmm. I can remember the Austin Dempster, the lighting cameraman, basically saying, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a challenge and it's going to take a little while. <coughs> Was this the shot? Might be. No, maybe in a minute. And in fact, you worked with Austin again. I did. Yes. I did. I, I very much liked the experience. Mm. Um, th they were they were so helpful. Uh, and and I, I think uh, Freddie Cooper, the, the, uh, the operator, I found... And this is very different from American um, camera operators. Freddie always knew um, what we were cutting to. In other words, at the end of a scene, he said, now, wait a minute, the next scene, we open on a close-up of something. And he's, therefore, he said we should end on a wide shot. He was thinking as, uh, uh, ahead of time about how the film would cut together, which was fantastic. And, and I, he was also very funny. Um, and... But, but he was a great guy and a, and a real team player. And I was so grateful to them because I, I, the, what I did have, you know, I, I didn't know lenses, but I did know the story. Uh, and I knew what story I wanted to tell. And that gave me, you know, the edge I needed, really. I mean, mm. and certainly they knew that. But they were 100% um, behind me all the time, which is invaluable. And... And where does your sort of origins question here, where does your interest in storytelling come from and maybe more specifically storytelling within a kind of visual medium or media? Well, what, what is interesting to me, in, I hope it is, in hindsight, is that I was trying to write at a very early age. Mm. And what I was trying to write was dialogue. I was never trying to write novels. I was the first thing I ever wrote was a, a Paul Temple serial, which was a radio serial. And I think it was about five pages long, so it was a bit short. But I mean, I was about 10 at the time, so it didn't matter. And then I put that ambition behind me. And my first job was in radio. And uh, uh, initially, I was a, a, a studio manager, which was just making... Um, you know, making sure the sound balance was was right, and one or two other things. It was a very, it was a very good milieu to be in because um, you, the BBC employed a lot of people who were sort of overqualified for a very simple job. But you knew that that there was a chance that they um, they might there might be a job for you in something more more creative. Mm. And I I started doing a little bit of writing. Um, I think the first thing I ever wrote was something. Uh, about air conditioning to be translated into Swahili, but it was still putting words on page. Yes. And, uh, and I was also uh, toying with the idea of being an actor. And I did a lot of amateur acting, which was very, very useful. It helped me direct because I, at least I understood something about comedy timing and, and what it's like to, you know, uh, just to be there and, and, and get the right, the words in the right order mm. and, and, and and, and sometimes how to get people on and off stage, etc. And Ian and I started writing uh, for amateur cabaret and mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing. 
And then I eventually got to television and that they, I got onto a director's course, which was very short, because essentially they said, we can't teach you how to direct. It's like theorizing about riding a bicycle. Sooner or later, you have to get up on the, mm. on the saddle and pedal. Mm. And, um, and, and at the end of it, they asked me to do a test piece. And uh, I said to Ian, well, let's take that sketch we've written and expand it. So that turned into The Likely Lads, which was the first thing mm -hmm. I did on, on TV. But it was, what was wonderful was directing what I'd written or what we'd written, because uh, if something better in, uh, occurred to anybody on the set, I didn't have to ask anybody's permission to change a line. And that's why I, I loved directing, um, you know, what, what we'd written, mm -hmm. be, be, because it gave you that freedom to, to feel that, uh, you know, you, you had complete carte blanche to, mm. to, to invent as you went along and suddenly put in a gag about Gatwick Handling, for example. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> now we come to the camp part of the movie uh, and, and Freddie Jones, who... <sighs> Extraordinary performance. Isn't it? It's just amazing. But he, he's, I, I love working with Freddie. Um, and I forget, I think I'd seen him on TV. I think there was a, an adaptation of an Evelyn War mm -hmm. trilogy mm -hmm. that I'd seen him in. Again, you know, nearly all these actors I'd seen somewhere doing something. Um, and, and he came along and very much brought his own uh, special qualities to it. Yes, out of this little spat that they have. <laughs> yes, yeah. So just um, pursuing the line of questioning that I opened up um, a little earlier, do, do you have um, a romantic attachment to the idea of cinema? Yes, I do. Um, you know, I was, I mean, certainly I, I was, I, w I was an amateur at it until I became and I stumbled into being a professional. Mm. But yes, I, there, there were all sorts. I, I used to go to the cinema a great deal, particularly when I first moved to London, I went to the National Film Theatre and saw a lot of you know, the old classics. Mm. And uh, I can't tell you that any one particular director influenced me. Mm. My editor <laughs> uh, used to say that I was, he, he saw something of Lubitsch in me. I didn't know what he meant by that, really. I had no idea what he meant, and whether it's, it was very nice of him to say so. Mm. But, but no, I can't say that there was... Uh, who, who did I like? Um, God, I, it, so many. Um, I really love... I remember Dick Lester and I having a, a, a conversation mm. where he thought that Buster Keaton was one of the greatest directors because we both agreed that The General is one of the best films we've ever seen where um, he said he never wasted a moment at all. He said all his cutaways are not just cutaways, they're, they're also part of the story and everything else. So that, that was the sort of influence. But it, 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 I really was green. And I was, mm, mm. Um, in a way, uh, what I've said to other people is sometimes that works to your advantage because you don't know what you don't know. And uh, that, that can be very helpful, actually. Um, and then, as I say, as long as you, you don't piss off the crew mm. um, and, and you, you get them on your side, it was enormous fun. I remember Ian came up to me um, after about a week of shooting and he said, you know, quietly, how are you getting on? And I said very quietly, so I said, I'm having the time of my life, which I was. Yeah. I mean, it was enormously exciting to be making a movie um, mm. with, with everybody behind it and a fantastic cast. And were you um, the kind of director that liked to run rushes? Did you look at the day's shooting? Yes, I looked at the, I looked mm. at the shooting, at the, at the rushes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I think, I know some actors don't like doing that. Mm. Um, but, um, no, I learned from it, I think, and I think you... You can see whether you've um, uh, whether you've covered things enough or not. And did various of the actors w watch the rushes, or did some choose to and others 
I don't Not remember the actors watching the rushes. Mm -hmm. Tom probably did, but I, I'm not sure he did. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I think sometimes, I think he his view was that it would make him too self conscious, so he didn't want to be too aware of uh, of what he was doing, and and think about it too much. I think that, if I remember rightly, that was his that was his preference. Mm. We haven't talked about the art direction, but it's uh, here is <laughs> there's <laughs> Otley pocketing something that might come in handy. Um, I love this sequence. I love the, I love the idea that he thinks he can be the tough guy. Yes, he gets himself all prepared to do it, and then just he just can't do it. Yes, <laughs> yes. Very uh, again, very unheroic. He is a good presence, Mr. Brown, John. He does Very look good. quite sinister. He looks like a man you wouldn't mess with. And he doesn't have to do much apart from just be there as this imposing presence. Exactly so, yeah. But lovely shadows, lovely light, lots going on. Yes. I think uh, Austin had worked with Oswald Morris, mm -hmm. um, who was a, a, a really brilliant cameraman. Can I ask, is this day for night? Yes, it is. It is, yeah. And here's Len Rossiter. Now, the interesting thing about this part, I hope it's interesting, is that I first offered it to Ronnie Barker. Um, and uh, this is obviously long before Porridge. Mm. But I, I loved him. And I, I wanted somebody, even though this, this, this guy is quite sinister, I wanted somebody with a... Uh, a talent for comedy as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, Len Rossiter is, a, is quite brilliant at both. But again, this, this character was inspired by, uh, well, when I was in an acting troupe very, as a very young guy, I, we went down to Cornwall in a bus and our sort of driver was an ex-commando, you know, who, a guy you really wouldn't mess with. And uh, he, he'd been through the war and been, done some very tough things. And I, I, I suddenly thought that that was the sort of guy who would be great for this. I liked having the coach. The coach was a, mm. a great prop. And this, this farm was not too far from Shepparton. Um, and it was um, a, a sequence where, I, I, again, the chemistry between his character and and uh, Otley's character was, um, gave, gave me exactly the kind of, it gave Otley some, the right person to bounce off. Yeah. That was the There's something that was going. very sort of human, almost emotional that, between them, isn't there? Yes, yes. Um, As if he, he doesn't really want to kill him. No. But it's just part of the job. Yes. And um, he, he doesn't even seem to be worried about whether he'll try and run away or anything like that. Um, there's a, there's a great sequence later where Otley tries to sneak up behind him to, to wallop him over the head. Yes. And it's so nice that it actually turns out to be an exercise that they're both colluding in. Yes. That he's sort of almost trying to teach him how to be yes. light-footed and commando-like. He says, I heard you're coming a mile yes, away. Yeah. Yes. And, the, and that, the way it delivers it is so yes. sweet. Yes. <laughs> but, there, but, but there is a, a sinister element to yes. the way Len Rossiter plays the part, so that you know, he's very laid back, but, but... But the balance is, as you say, is perfect, I think. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Because it would be all too easy for him to be hard and rough. And, you know. Yes, yes. This is a set. Mm -hmm. um, shot at Shepparton. So when I, I started to introduce the idea of this sort of these layers of international intrigue earlier, and obviously we, we, we've gone on to many things between, but... I, I, because it starts to get very labyrinthine, um, as a viewer, I think it's fair to say that you can almost get lost. Does it matter that you don't really understand the, the ins and outs or that you might not if you're not paying attention? Is it, is it important? Well, it, I think it's a possible flaw. I mean, I think, I think the flaw was in the book and we may not have cured it entirely. Mm. I didn't mean it as a criticism at all. What I, I, I suppose... It, it, I suppose it, it sort of, it's sort of like the David and Goliath thing that is set up between the small man and the institution, the, you know, the, the, the country or the mechanism. And I, 
the difficulty to understand or penetrate the big machine is almost what this is partly about, perhaps. I don't know. Well, I think that's fair. And it's, it's maybe fair to say, too, that uh, the truth is nearly always more complicated than you think. Mm. There are wheels within wheels mm. and, and um, you know, double dealings with... I mean, you know, you get this in the carry as well, mm. you know, where um, there's, there's usually a, a hidden agenda yeah. somewhere. And I think we, we did sort of go for that. Mm. Um, because knowing who's on whose side ultimately becomes very, very difficult to work out. But it strikes me that, ra again, rather than that being a criticism, that's... Uh, a kind of a truth, almost. Yes, I think that's true. Mm. So he now knows there was a tape recorder in the... There's... Uh, yes, that's true. I, I love all of this technology because it's the kind of film that you couldn't you couldn't set it today. You know, with our telecommunication systems and digital footprints and so on, you can't have this kind of intrigue, can you? You can't have... No, it, it, it's interesting that... The observation that Ian and I often make writing is, uh, when you're when you're thinking of something that isn't now, you say, well, is this before or after cell phones? Because cell phones have changed everything. Yeah. In the old days, you had to find a call box, and then you had to find the money for the call box. And in a way, uh, we we've, we've written a a cop series set in the '60s, which we still hope to make. Mm. And uh, you know, it's very much part of that. It's the it's. I get very bored, I'm afraid, with movies where suddenly um, everything is on a computer and you, it's people tapping keys, which sort of gets, however hard you try, it's, it's very hard to make that madly interesting. Yes. But the, 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 the low-tech aspect of this, I think, is, um, is a plus, actually. Yes, and I love the fact that he's absolutely bowled over by this idea that you can record something in this little shoe isn't he, sitting there recording the radio, and I, yes. I love that kind of excitement. Yes. this kind of quite primitive technology. Yes. So he hasn't escaped, he's been chained up in a pigsty. Yes. Again, that's some, it's, quite, it's quite brutal, the fact that he's chained up, and in fact we don't know until he lifts his leg, do we? But, but again, it's that idea that they're sort of hanging out together but then there's this <laughs> this dark under yes. undercurrent yes <laughs> yes being treated like a dog now there is an answer machine in this scene yes this indeed mu it's must huge. be a, a very early answer machine yes. because uh, they not everybody had them mm. nice dress yeah she looks great freddie cooper behind the camera was very much in love with her uh-huh um. And so, um, how long did your relationship with Columbia last? Well, I did another film for them. I did mm. um, a severed head for Indeed. them. I mean, I don't think. Uh, you, you know, do you have a relationship with the studio? I mean, I think if it, if it suits them, you do. Mm -hmm. I, 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 they probably had a, an option on me for another movie, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's very much the the freelance world. You mm -hmm. you go where the work is, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I don't find there's a set pattern to it. So this wasn't the first in a multi picture deal that. No, no, no. but as I say, I did do one more. With yes, him. indeed. Um, yeah. I'll give and Otley, uh, not Otley, sorry, um, Tom Courtney's star was very much in The Ascent at the time, having been in huge films, Long Distance Runner, etc. Yeah, and of course, the, the whatever persona he brought to the screen w was very much, you know, working class mm. and, and man of the people, you know, it was, it was he was one of a, a new breed of actor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, very, very true, very uh, honest. But at the same time, what he revealed in this film, I think, was a, a talent for comedy, which he hadn't particularly had a chance to see, to show before. Mm -hmm. um, this, is all, this is a typical sort of scene of Otley trying to make sense of what the hell is going on. Yeah. And uh, he's totally out of his depth Absolutely. almost all the time in the whole movie. 
little portent there. Oh, this is the scene we referred to earlier. Yes. So I think it's a lovely... Yes, where lovely he creeps touch. up behind him yeah. and he knows he's coming. Yeah. Yeah, I liked the shooting inside the bus too yeah. because I, it gave you that nice uh, visual quality which yeah. was quite and, fun. And the back of that bus will prove to be quite an important yes. element of the plot, wouldn't yes. it? Yes, it does. Well, he very often finds himself rodding around in, in the manure, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> quite literally. Yes. So the sun shining here, which prompts me to act, ask, um, when did shooting start? Well, it started at the beginning of March, March 4th, to be precise, of that year, which gave us a problem because um, spring was just around the corner, and obviously spring happened during the course of the eight-week shoot. So we had to be very careful. We were very aware that if there were... Uh, you know, it's no look at the leaves. Mm. Not many, and and later on they they definitely got more. So we were aware of that. Mm. Now this sequence is on a genuine tube station, Notting Hill. Mm. No, it's not Notting Hill. Uh, oh yes, this bit Notting is Notting Hill Gate. Yes, this yes. this is Notting Hill. Mm -hmm. But this but the station is uh, the disused station in um, uh, in the Strand. Oh okay. Um, we had to use, a, a, this is too technical for me to explain to you, but we had to use a different stock mm. for the sequence on the, on the underground, which is why the, the visuals are slightly different. Mm. Um, but this, this, yes, this says Notting Hill, but this was, this was um, a disused, it's that little station, I think it's called Aldrich. It's okay. the Aldrich station, mm -hmm. and, and it's, there's a little spur line. I I'm not sure it's used anymore, I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we this was our location, and we were able to to shoot the sequence in reasonable comfort. Um, and so here we are again with the other stock that you're talking about, and we yes. can see that there's definitely a different kind of aesthetic. And that, was that something to do with the lighting? Do we yes, think? Yes, it, mm -hmm. it was. It was. I don't know what it was, but it was certainly some. This is another one of my visual <laughs> <laughs> jokes. That, that's found on the on the set. Merely because I, I saw that poster and I thought, you know, that there's a, a moment for, mm -hmm. for Ockley just mm -hmm. responding to that, mm -hmm. given that it's his predicament. Um, so it's fun when you are able to find little moments like that. Mm. And Tom is just kind of up for that, is he? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a moment where I, uh, I uh, when we come to it, where I told him something was going to happen that he didn't know or hadn't rehearsed for because I wanted him to be thrown by it. I wanted him oh. to be on it, but I, I did tell him it was going to happen mm -hmm. so that he could use it again, rather like the Portobello Road. He was able to use the moment. Mm. Um, so this is the, the classic exchange. Um, it's a good catch. <laughs> and so... Um, there's a lot of working on location. We're in a location right now. Um, is that something that you enjoyed, the location work, as opposed to doing it all on the set? I prefer the locations because I think, because, the, you know, as I said, we just saw with that poster, it's a silly mm. little thing, but mm. stuff occurs on location that you, that you don't uh, anticipate, and then I think you can use it, um, which I think is... is, is, is Mm. Much a part of the fun, I I think you feel on the on the on the set, uh, you, you feel a bit more constrained and a mm. li little bit more hidebound by knowing everybody else is around you. I I think I, I do prefer location, and mm. I think it gives you something much more. Um, keeps it fresh. Mm -hmm. And logistically speaking, does it change? I mean, obviously it does change things enormously, but it doesn't create more problems to work on location? Well, obviously it can do. It mm. depends on the location and it depends on how many passes by. But I think we were lucky, you see, I mean, even going back to that Portobello Road shot at the beginning, you know, we didn't have to get clearances from people mm. and we were able to... It, the, the camera was hidden at the back mm. in the back of a, 
of a van so that nobody knew it was uh, it was there. But um, you know, you can get away you could get away with things more easily then than you can now. Mm. There again is a poster that I think I found on location. I, I don't oh, think that we, works very well. I yes. don't think we'll. Uh, we'll I, I think I must have seen it and said, "Oh, let's use that." Um, yes, last time I watched this, I found myself asking whether or not that had been made for the production. But you think it was actually there? I think it was. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Uh, and certainly the Julie Andrews one was, I think. Mm. You know. um, but. Uh, no, I, 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 prefer, I preferred location, but it, I, all, all the stuff down on the houseboats, for example, you know, it's, um, that, 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 was, that had a lovely sense of locality and a mm. sense, again, of Britain. Mm. Now Len is about to kill him. Indeed. I'm just wondering if the moment that you referred to earlier is the moment coming up. It must be something else. The moment of not of Tom not quite knowing what's going to happen. It's not this moment coming. No, no, it's not uh, this one. Because uh, 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 that is quite a surprise moment, certainly to the audience. It's it's <laughs> it's quite a moment. Yes, hopefully it is. Yeah, very good. So that was the end of uh, of Johnston. Yeah. Um, I, again, because now somebody's well, it's the second corpse in the in the movie actually. Mm. Um, we yeah we want we wanted something quite nasty to happen to Ockley so that he, you know he he really is aware of the seriousness of the situation and uh, we don't show what he's looking at. No, it's nicely realised in that respect. It's simple. Uh, and effective. There's, there's a death later on involving the coach that um, there was there was one shot that was. It was actually a sound effect. I'll, yeah, I'll tell crunch. you when we shot it. Oh well, yes. <laughs> uh, and I, ha I had to modify it because it was actually t too graphic. Right. That's Ken Cranham in the middle, who's a very distinguished actor who we work with a lot later on in television. Mm -hmm. It's a tiny part again, but um, is is Robin Asquith there as well? Yes. Yes. The yes. young man with the in white. Yes, Robert Gillespie, who I work with mm -hmm. again in um, in television, and I think that's Donald McKillop. Um, who was in The Likely Lads. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was nice working with some of the people I'd worked with before. I love this idea of Otley having to do the police work for them. Yes. <laughs> to turn himself in. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and there's another wonderful actor coming up. Um, oh. And he's, he's thrilled. Paul Angelis? Is it? Uh, not uh, Paul Angelis, but also oh. Jeffrey Bailden. Oh, I'm, yes. I'm very fond of it. This, this is Paul Angelis. He's yeah. wonderful, isn't he? Yes. Absolutely uh, fantastic. Again, this is standing the. Uh, uh, it, it's surprise. You know, it's doing the opposite of what you expect. There he is in the police station. They're being terribly nice to him. So it's. Um, and I love this moment of leaving the door open. And he says, "Is there a draft?" Doesn't he? <laughs> it's such a great line. <laughs> it's fabulous. Yes. That's so good. He's a he's a great actor. I think. Lovely. Mm. Again, in a small part. And, yeah. Um, so can we take? The opportunity to talk a little bit more about Tom as a as a person, about you know, we talked about him being in a kind of ascendancy at the time of making this. Is it? Did he have a desire to make it as a as a big actor? Well, I think the, I think uh, Tom took his acting extremely seriously, but I don't think he had the desire to be a movie star, uh, and, and the choices that he made um, after this. Uh, leaned very much towards the theatre, where he went up to the to Manchester a lot, and he worked with the same director on quite a few um, plays. And he wanted to, he, he, you know, he wanted to test himself and, uh, and 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 learn as an actor and great and add depth to his ability, as opposed to just, you know, taking the money and being a movie star. I think I think that was very much. The, the path that he chose for himself, mm, mm. Um, and I, d I don't think he's regretted it. I think he's, you know, he's he's highly respected as he should be, mm. um, but but he he took the parts that he he felt belonged to him and 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 that would nurture him as an actor and give him the experience that he wanted. Casper Reed was uh, the director he worked with in Manchester a ah. great deal, mm -hmm. or is it Reader? I, forget how he pronounced it. Mm -hmm. 
And he, of course, he did A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich later on um, with the same director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, there's a period not long after your film, this film, when um, Tom doesn't work in film and just devotes himself to theatre entirely, a number of years, in fact. That's true. Yes. That's true. And yes, a lot of lot of very serious. And he never seemed to be in any two minds about it. He mm. he had a, a very uh, a very clear idea about it. I mean, we knew him very well. Ian actually shared a flat with him for a while uh -huh. um, at, at, down on, on the Hurlingham Road in Fulham. So uh, they saw a lot of each other. They were fairly hopeless bachelors. <laughs> um, they. Um, one by one, the light set went out, and neither of them had the sense to be able to actually change a light bulb. So <laughs> I think finally the last light bulb went out, and then they moved. But uh, it, it was something like that. But, they, they were, but we, did, we did know each other very well, and uh, we've remained friends, mm. which is uh, something we, we all value. Mm. Um, and here's Otley still trying to work out what the hell is going on. Indeed. And so um, how long was the, the shoot? We, we had eight weeks. Um, it took eight weeks. And then we, uh, when we put it together, we decided to do a little bit more with the car chase and amp that up a bit. So I think we went out for an extra couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I mean, I, we, we were um, under budget, mm -hmm. um, just, yeah. you know, but I mean, that's, <laughs> that's okay. I, th I think we were able to... Um, to, to to not break the bank in terms of uh, the, the the suits, you know, who, mm -hmm. who were breathing down my neck, but but not in an unkind way at all. Mm. I mean, they, they were pretty supportive, nervous but supportive. I mean, again, because they they knew that I was a neophyte anyway, and, mm. and so was so was Bruce, and so um, that that's why um, Carl Foreman came in. I, I'm going to tell you his big note, okay, um, because it's. It's relevant to what to where we are. Mm -hmm. He read the script when we turned it in, and he said, "It's a good script. Well done." He said, "It lacks something, which, for the lack of a better phrase, I will term a chariot race." What do I mean by a chariot race? He said, "I mean one of those sequences where, when they're walking out of the cinema, people say to each other, "What about that bit when, whatever that is." He said, go away and ride a chariot race. So we listened to Carl and, you know, he knew what he was talking about. And that's when we discovered that we had established that Otley wasn't a very good driver already, quite well. And we had also had that throwaway line where he said, uh, I've got my driving test on Tuesday. And it, it was a wonderful light bulb moment where we suddenly said, what if there's a car chase while he's taking his driving test? I mean, that that was the... That was definitely uh, came about. It was it was the best note I think we've ever had from a mm. producer because it was a wonderful note. Mm. Um, and what was was lovely was that perhaps self subconsciously we had well, we discovered that we had sown the seed that yeah. we could now reap, as it were. Uh, so that it was it was a very good note because undoubtedly it the the, the film did need mm. something just to lift it and. And to have something that that you would remember when, you know, years later, I think if people remember the movie and haven't seen it for a long time, they say, "Oh yeah, what about that that, that car chase?" So, uh, and here is Jimmy Cousins playing the the uh, driving instructor, and it's a wonderful comic performance it's from fantastic. him as a man who's in the middle of it because he looks like a man we would not want to be taking our driving test and. Um, I think they'd worked together before. I think Tom had worked with Jimmy Cousins before, and he made him laugh, mm. and they made each other laugh. And this is where he spots the villains. Um, and at this point, you just know it's all going to go <laughs> wrong, don't you? The yes. fact that they're just waiting there. Yeah. But it's a it, it's a performance that, I mean, um, Jimmy Cousins' performance really helps enormously. Um, and we had enormous fun shooting this because. Mm. Uh, obviously, suddenly you're into action. Mm. As I say, this is a tiny car, and uh, some of the time, I I was driving it while we were getting the shots. We I think we we put the camera fixed onto the the hood 
or bonnet, mm -hmm. depending on which country you're in. <laughs> uh, so the, 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 the camera's there on either Tom or um, the driving instructor. Yeah. Um, but when it was the driving instructor, I was driving it because, you know, I, I wanted to, to see his reactions. Mm. And, um, and when it was on him, now it is, it is Tom driving. It's not a stuntman, I don't mm -hmm, think. Mm -hmm. And so... Because the camera's mounted on the bonnet, as you said. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yes, it is. It's a brilliant scene, a sequence. It's, it's fabulous. Can I just um, ask where we were location-wise, just where the cars were parked? Oh, that was Shepherd's Bush. Shepherd's Bush, yeah. Uh, yes, I think it's the Axbridge Road. Mm -hmm. There's a big government building there that looks... Um, look, coming to take us away. Uh, look, it looks as if it's it, it's sort of um, governmental, as it were. It does, were. yes. And these locations uh, were nearly all Notting Hill, mm. around the, the back streets of Notting Hill. You can see the Kensington, uh, yep. Grenfell Road, it's Indeed. still there, I'm sure. Yes, well, that's unfortunately where the fire was, Grenfell Towers. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, the entirety of the chase happens around the west of, of London, doesn't it? Yes. 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 <laughs> I love the way that you get the hill start, the three-point turn, the reversing around the court, all of the, the, key, the key notes. All the things we remember from taking our own driving yes. tests, I yeah. know. Um, <laughs> yes, we've, we've, Ian and I have done lecture tours, and we've, uh, 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 you know, where we've shown clips from our work. Mm. And this is one of them, and uh -huh. I think we start it here. Um, uh, and and it, it still plays extremely well. Yeah. People enjoy the sequence very much. Yeah. Um, so he's now motivated to drive, so he can suddenly do it. And this is a nice, this is a nice gag. <laughs> that he can't do it. Yes. Wonderful. He's blaming the clutch. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it was enormously... And, and this was the sequence where... They, because they knew it was a winner, mm. um, they, they gave us another couple of days. All of this, I think, was in the original sequence, but I think there's a little bit extra that, that we did shoot. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember exactly which shots were afterwards. There was the Steptoe and Son moment. Rag and Bone Man, yeah. Yeah. Um, but every time I see it, I'm very impressed with... Um, mm. Mr. Cousins' performance, because he's very, very funny. Oh, absolutely. And the increments of him moving, you know, into submission... Yes. ...are, are fascinating yeah. as well. I mean, I, I give credit to our editor, too, because I um, must have discussed it with him. And, and we, mm. you know, he it's, it's put together pr pretty well, actually. I mean, oh, given yes. that uh, I'd never done one before, but... Um, and so given that this wasn't in one of the earlier iterations of your screenplay, um, did it replace something quite significant that, you know, was something taken out? No, it didn't replace anything. I, mm. I, I think it, it literally was us putting another three or four pages in mm -hmm. the script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, uh, bless Carl, he was absolutely right. It was, mm. it was definitely uh, um, an improvement to... Yeah. Uh, well, a huge improvement. I mean, it, it was... Uh, a moment where people said, what about that moment when, you know? Mm. And that's exactly what he knew. And so he, he, he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> oh, this, is a, this is a wonderful moment. Absolutely. But, um, they, they, uh, these guys used to drive around like this with, with L Place. Did you ever see them? Because they, it, it, there's always something very funny about watching them pile up. They, and they do it so convincingly as well, because it yes. could have looked very, you know, forced. Yes. But it doesn't. That's great. Gosh, lots of people taking their own lives in their hands here. Well, I'd like to think they all knew what they were doing. <laughs> it worked out. And this is the end of the sequence. And uh, This is Latimer Road or something, do we think? The what? Latimer Road around there? Or? Yes, it's, it, it, it's, it's pretty... I mean, the, 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 the uh, Unigate... Uh, that, that that was in um, White uh, White City, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know. I don't think it's still there, mm -hmm. but uh, it used to be. 
and my brother worked for Unigate, so I, I think he was quite amused that I was able to get Unigate into the movie. Oh, very good. Um, and that's the end. Yeah. Yes, very good. Fantastic sequence. Now we get into the corridors of power. I mean, the point is, you've never really been quite sure who these villains work for. You know, whether, absolutely. Uh, whether they're, you know, on our, our side or the the other side, whatever mm. the other side is. Mm. So, I, you're right. There is a, a deliberate, um, you know, ambiguity mm -hmm. about who's mm -hmm. who. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's valid. And of course, now we're meeting Alan Bedell, who we've only glimpsed briefly until yes. now and he seems to be the big boss at the party was he at yes the party? we saw him yes, at the party that's right. and there is mention of his impending knighthood or some yes, such something like there that, then something yes. like that and he's a wonderful actor oh yeah really such super a, actor. a real swagger yes, there's there's tom wondering whether there's anything worth nicking <laughs> yes um I th you, you were asking me about you know what level he was at, and did he really know what he was doing? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm. He's not Lovejoy, as it were. Mm. You know, uh, which who was our character played by Ian McShane on TV, who knew everything and and could sort of sense in his bones if he was in the presence of, of something that was really really valuable. Mm. No, he's not quite in that league. Mm. But I mean, obviously, that's whatever speciality he has. That's his that's in the his antique province. trade. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. yeah. But so. we're not meant to feel necessarily that he's out of his depth in that world necessarily. No, no. But, but 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 he's a know, bit of a chancer, perhaps. At, 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 it's a very good word. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's mm -hmm. exactly what he is. Mm -hmm. um, still trying to make sense of who's who and what's what. Yeah. Um, much as I would be in that circumstance, I and mean, that's yeah. what we we tried to we tried to we, to put ourselves in his shoes. Yeah. Which, uh, as as a writer, that's what you're always trying to do with every part, you know, trying to imagine how the world looks from that particular perspective. I mean, perspective. is it a little bit reductive or fair enough to call it kind of a, a, a proletariat picture? I mean, it's, a, is it, it's, it's about being faced with all of this stuff and kind of going, I don't get this, you know, and can I be at the mercy of this unless I try to engage with it, you know? I suppose that's true, yes, to some extent, mm. yeah. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much into it. No, but okay. It, but it's... But now Otley is looking quite posh, so yeah. he's certainly had his costume changed finally. Indeed. This is the Playboy Club. This is the scene where I, I, I told Freddie Jones to do something in the middle of a scene. And I said to Tom, something's going to happen that you haven't rehearsed. I deliberately want you to be slightly ah. on the back foot. Ah. Uh, just keep going, and, and uh, you'll see the moment when they sit down together. These were the days of... Bunny girls, as you can see. Yes. And here's Freddie. I love him having his cigarette at the same time, but holding it the way. Yes. It's, uh, and, and the size great. of this pepper mill. Which yes. Is yeah. Quite ridiculous. But it's a fantastic no, the moment, affectation. The moment it? coming up is is the the dandruff on his shoulder. Uh, 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 that and I, Tom didn't know it was happening, and I I thought it would be. And there's a line, isn't there? Something like, "I know a man." I know a good man for that. Yes. It's, Perfect. It, it seemed it seemed camp enough to yes. to. To, to suit Freddie. And I, I, I think, you know, we, we certainly put that on, put, put the line in it, uh, it, while we were shooting. It's interesting because it's very sort of disconcerting but, but not violent. You know, yeah. it's about power, isn't it? Yes, yes. And, and making people feel uncomfortable. Yes, yeah. Um, so that even though he's got the suit on, he's, he's still at, at a the, disadvantage. Yes, yeah. Oh, that'd be very interesting to rewatch knowing that. It's... <laughs> It's coming up any second. <laughs> Just the way he holds that. Uh... And his face is always twitching and something's always happening. Yeah. And I think he's wearing nail varnish too. Yes. Yeah. Or, or, or certainly, uh, the... that's it. That's the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Tom dealt with it very well. I mean, again, you know, it's, it's staying in character. It's, you can't often do that, but no. it's fun when you can. Uh, and. It's the sort of thing you can only do on film, you know, yeah. where, where you can capture a moment. Yeah. Um, so this, <laughs> That's very good. It, it was an interesting location, too. <laughs> He's really living it up now. He's, 
he's quite enjoying it, I think. Yes. Oh, yes. yes, I think he's enjoying a taste. Mm. Um, this is a set. Mm -hmm. And he's managed to get it all over his, his trousers. Yes. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> I think what Ian and I always tried to do was never waste a moment. Mm. You know, I mean, always try to find something that was going on uh, at all times. So here's Romy again. Um, we put a few lines in when we get to the health farm, I think we, we, mm -hmm. we put a few extra lines in, in post-production. Um, we haven't talked about the music either, which is... Um, Tom Partridge did the opening song, which yeah. was very appropriate to his character. It yes. felt very much... Yeah. Stanley Myers did the rest of the music, and I worked with Stanley again. He, yeah. Stanley did, wrote that fantastic uh, main theme from The Deer Hunter, ah, yes. which is absolutely brilliant. Incredibly prolific, brilliant composer. Yes, yes. Yeah. He was, he was great. And how did that work then? How, what was your professional relationship? Like? Well, it, it, the extraordinary thing about the music is that, you know, you, in post-production, you come in and you discuss where you think the music should be mm. and what you think it should, should be doing for the film. Then what I discovered in my, uh, again, in my innocence was all of a sudden um, you're in a recording studio with 25 musicians mm -hmm. and the idea that if you don't like something, I mean, it's a bit, it's too bad because mm. there they are. I mean, you might be able to move, influence it slightly, but you, you better hope you like it mm. because, I mean, obviously, if, if you're suddenly... Uh, you know, a senior director with a lot of movies under your belt, you can actually kick the whole score out and start all over again. I certainly couldn't, mm. and um, nobody would have thought of doing that. Mm. So you're, you're in a situation where it's almost a fait accompli, which mm. I, 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 I didn't know that ahead of time, but I, I think I might have asked for one little tiny nuance changed in the music, you know. Um, but uh, it's, th this is where I think we put in some extra lines. Um, about something about colonic irrigation. Oh, maybe. and then he came at me with that thing. <laughs> it was fantastic. Yes, that yeah. dreadful thing, I think. That dreadful was. thing, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Very nice. So, so I don't want to lose that thread um, about working with, with Stanley then. So the, the question that arises in my mind is about, is about collaboration. Obviously, you are a great collaborator, having worked with Ian for so many years. It, that question of collaborating across all of the different parts of the creative process is that something that you're open to? I mean, I know you've just expressed some kind of misgivings or there being some concerns sometimes, but in general, would you say that you are a collaborator, a happy collaborator? Yeah, I think I am. Um, and as I said earlier, I, you know, the working with the crew and, and, and getting them on my side was, uh, was indicative of that, you know. The, mm. and, and they were, they were very much, you know, you know um, they, they were working as a team and, and, and suggesting things. And um, Freddie Cooper particularly is the operator. And apparently in, in America, the operator never says a word to the director. Mm -hmm. Whereas he's the guy who's looking through the lens and he can tell you, um, you know, whether something's worked or not. I, I did a chase with him in another movie where we had to have somebody jump from a moving boat into a dinghy, into a rubber dinghy. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy fell in the water and I thought oh god we've got to do it again and Freddie said where are you going to be cutting are you going to be cutting the moment that his feet hit the, the rubber dinghy and I said yeah he said then you've got the shot and so he saved me from doing a retake because he again thinking ahead as an editor which was so smart mm -hmm. he was able to you know to, to anticipate where I was going to put the scissors in wow, that's brilliant and so he was he was absolutely great mm. but I, I think you know, if you don't get the editor on your side, mm. uh, sorry, not the, the, the crew on your mm -hmm. side, everybody, mm. um, you're doing yourself a huge disservice because mm. they can, um, same for actors. I heard a story years ago about an actor who so upset um, the crew that um, 
they d decided that all his close-ups from that moment on would be very slightly out of focus. <laughs> that was their revenge. Um, so, you know, it's, you don't want to mess them around. So here she is in a wig, looking different again. Yes. Uh, we, we should just touch upon the fish and chips. I, lo I love the intrigue of him going down to get the, you know, the briefcase. You think, yes. oh, what's this all about? Yes. And he's got his fish and chips. Lovely. Well, I think we've always been intrigued by, uh, by health farms. We heard a story years ago about uh, two people at a health farm, one of whom was Keith Moon. Um, and they were so hungry that they went for a walk and knocked on somebody's door when they smelt, they smelt chicken roasting from a house. They knocked on the door and offered to buy the chicken from, from, the, uh, from the lady and she said, it's for my husband's dinner. And they, they offered her a hundred pounds for it and I think she took it and they smuggled <laughs> it back into the health farm. So we've... Um, uh, uh, very rock and roll. Yes, we, we've always been... The, the, whole, uh, the health farm as a setting is something which we've, we've tried to use. And, um, What's the peculiar fascination? Well, I suppose it's because people are trying to be good mm -hmm. and, and, tr and trying to, um, uh, you know, take a... Uh, do, do themselves good, but still they're fighting mm -hmm. um, their, their better selves. Mm -hmm. uh, Can I just make a, a, a comment or an observation? I was quite surprised when watching this... Um, I think all the times I've ever seen it, that he gets the girl or that there is a kind of, I know we don't get a sex scene, but we get quite an explicit reference you, you, to you, it being there. You, you get the, the sense that yes, you do. Because um, it's not part of the idea of, in a way, being the unhero and not quite living up to those sort of macho spy traits. Maybe we'd have believed it slightly more if she'd been an English girl. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that she's Romy Schneider somehow, that right. where she is, She's a movie star, yeah. you know, and, and uh, in a way, I didn't want a movie star for that very mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. but bless her heart, I mean, she looks gorgeous, I must say. Yeah. Looking at it again, she certainly could take a close up. Um, and, and I say what I've just said, not as a criticism, it's just, you know, that it's quite a surprising moment. Yes. And the, the film has a few surprising moments, so it's not a bad thing by any stretch. Yes. And again, he, 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 now he thinks he's, he's got agency, you know, he thinks he's actually doing the right thing and that he's actually being proactive, doesn't he? He's starting That's to right. believe himself in a way, believe the story of that... him as some great mastermind or something. Yes, he's, he's, he's been seduced into the, uh, into the role yeah. and now, now he's sort of trying to live up to it. Um, now there are the trees, so the trees are still pretty bare. So I think I think we must have shot this quite early. So in terms of the shooting chronology, the schedule, did you do a lot of these kind of shots around the same kind of time, so you wouldn't have to have these seasonal difference become apparent? Yeah. So I mean, mm -hmm. we, all the farm stuff we shot, you know, yeah. in, in one sequence. Yes. You know, yes. In one, you know, three or four days. Have you ever worked on anything where you've just shot chronologically through the script? No, not, not completely. No. I mean, you, you, you hardly ever can. Mm. Um, I mean, I think I was fairly lucky that we did start in Notting Hill, so we, you know, that, that did establish the media and did establish... Um, yes. I, I know we, we, we definitely, that was definitely day one, the one I told, told you about. And were there any ambitions that you had in terms of shots, sequences, etc., that you had to sort of pull back from as you started shooting? You realised that technically it wouldn't be achievable or logistically it would be too complicated? No, I don't, I don't think there was anything that, that we had to change. Mm. Uh, in in post-production, the, uh, I think I referred to it already, the, the, the death of, uh, of Hendrickson, James mm. James Villiers, I had to tone that mm, down. Mm, mm. Uh, it was actually taking out a sound effect. I mean, um, the sound effect that's there, I mean, we'll, it'll come up with maybe we'll even pause to let it, um, let it ring out when the time comes, but it's still pretty nasty. Well, it was nastier. Right. It, it was definitely nasty. Was there perhaps more squelch than crunch? That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it made you, certainly made you think. I mean, it was intentional, mm. but, but I mean, it made my, um, my producer got worried. Yes. Um, because it's not a nasty film, is it? Uh, you know. No, no. So again, you want 
that you want to get the tone right. I mean, yes. we wanted, we certainly wanted tension here. I mean, this is the, the you know, this is the, the final action sequence of mm. the movie. Mm. And there is Hendrickson, who obviously, you're right about the, the class thing is very, is, is very much um, a subtext of this sequence because mm. Hendrickson clearly looks down and despises this, this low-life Ockley yeah. as somebody he would never mix with socially, that's for sure. Um, and uh, it, he was very good. Um, Again, I, 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 I know I'm reaching for grand themes, but would you say that there's something that runs through all of your work, which is, I don't want to kind of get all auteurist on you, but is there something that fascinates endlessly that you that don't feel that you'd ever put to bed? Well, I, I think, you know, certainly starting with the likely lads and indeed porridge, I mean, and our feeders own pet, the, uh, our television work, mm. we were always writing for the underdogs. We were writing for people who had not made it. We weren't writing for fat cats, that's for sure. Mm. And to a great extent, they were struggling against the odds. And Otley is in that, uh, in that genre to a great extent. I mean, he, you know, he's definitely, he's not in charge of... Uh, of his life, mm. and um, you know, in that respect, I think uh, there is a there is a theme there. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, I like rooting for the underdog, mm. definitely. Thank you, chickens. <laughs> there he is in the muck again. So this is uh, homage to Sam Peckinpah. <laughs> well, not quite, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, it, it needed, it certainly needed sort of something here where yeah. he's in real jeopardy. Uh, and you, you needed something to top the car sequence, which is yes. spectacular. Yes. This just sort of takes the tension. Well, the car sequence is obviously comedic. Yes. Uh, and, th and this is not. This Absolutely. Is, this is designed to be definitely it's threatening. jeopardy. And I'm yeah. sure that, I'm, I can't hear the music at the moment, but I'm sure that mm. Stanley's doing his job to, to heighten that. Yeah, yes, yeah. 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 Whitewash again with planted that earlier. Mm. I like the fact that um, I like using something that has already been there in an understated way. Yes. And of course, the coach is the same thing. Um, coach was there, now can he start it? Yeah, there's nothing where you think, I just don't believe that. You know, as you say, you've sort of almost subliminally said it's there um, and then it'll have a function later on and that's happening quite a lot, isn't yes. it? Yes. Well, it's typical of Otley that the first thing he does is put the windscreen wipers on accidentally. Yeah. So nothing is coming easily. Mm. There he is. Mm. And he's, he's concerned. He Absolutely. Doesn't, he doesn't... He's not a killer. Mm. And in fact, he offers to help, doesn't he? And yes. It's, again, it's quite touching, really. Yeah. But, you know, injecting the human back into what is otherwise... Quite a Machiavellian well, he, state again, of affairs. He, you know, he's acting as one hopes one would act oneself. You know, Indeed. A, 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 yeah. With a conscience. That's what Ian and I were always trying to do, put ourselves in his shoes. Yeah. And, and, and you know, he's not a killer. He's mm. definitely not somebody who would do that. Mm. And then he hears, this is the moment. Mm. Maybe we should let this play then, shall we? Should we hear what we were left with? Yes. It's a nasty way to kill somebody, I will say that. Mm. It's... <laughs> that bump. Yes. Um, yeah. that, that's the moment where you know he's gone. Indeed. And yeah. you, you're, you're rooting for him, aren't you? Because he is almost getting himself out of the way. Yes. Uh, and then, oh, so that's the guy. Yes. So there's our twist. Yeah. Um, and they don't want him dead. Yes. Particularly, so. Um, and again, just in terms of the threads that you've been, I'm going to mix my metaphors now, weaving. Um, the fact that he's there at the party, they don't really speak, but there is a, a, a very brief non-committal exchange between them. So yes, yes. Th there's a kind of, Yes. A mirror or something, there's a, yes. you know, a symmetry. Yeah, and, and it's, I mean, what you try and do in, in movie writing, certainly, is, is set things up and, 
uh, you know, here's, here's yes, the, um, the, re the, the recording, except he's going to screw it up. But, <laughs> In a way but, that only Otley can. Yeah. So, but uh, now he thinks he's got the picture. Yes. Um, again. Yes. But again, Hadrian is definitely the establishment. Yes, indeed. And and so you know he and and Otley is the little man. Yeah. You know, the, the, he, he's all of us um, mm. struggling to make sense of what's going on in the world. Yeah. And, you, and, and one knows he, there are always more sinister things that we're not supposed to know about. Yep. Um, but. Um, Yes, and you, you kind of, you think you might be getting towards, because there's quite a lot of um, explanation here. Or, yes. you know, and you think, oh, yes. I think I'm nearly there. I think I'm nearly there with understanding what's going on. Yes. Uh, and of course, I'm not really. <laughs> yes. That's a lovely shot. And he still doesn't want to look at it. Mm. So this was the last part of the sequence at this farm, which as I say, happily, was only about five miles from Shepparton. Uh -huh. So um, were, I think you referred to them as the suits before, I hope I'm not imposing that phrase on you, but were the suits happy with the performance of the film? Yes, we were slightly, I mean, we finished the film and it didn't come out right away. They sat on it for a little bit, which was very alarming, mm -hmm. because when you've made a film, you want people to see it. And the fact that we were sort of, waiting for that to happen for longer than I wanted to was a little disconcerting. Mm. So you wonder whether they quite knew what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then they, uh, I remember we went, we had a premiere which was actually at the Odeon High Street, Kensington, which was not exactly the West End, but nevertheless it was, uh, it was fine. It was, mm. it was, at, and the, the, um, the reviews were very good mm. on the whole. Um, whether it made them a profit, I don't know. No. Uh, now, we did actually shoot at Buckingham Palace, and this was quite cheeky. You wouldn't get away with this now, because we did manage to get a shot of one of our actors in a car going through the... Oh, my goodness. These are people arriving for a garden party, I think, so we knocked off a few shots. There's, there's our man. He's really going into Buckingham Palace. And he's really <laughs> going... There's Otley. Um, it's not that it, it wasn't that shot, but it, he did actually go in. Wow! And Was then, he unceremoniously booted out? Yes. <laughs> There's the obligatory um, yes pop group that's waiting for for their MPs yep. or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Nice um, touch that. I like that. But we don't see the monarch. No. But he's got his K. It's a very short and sweet sequence, isn't it? It says all he needs yes. to say. Yes. No, I, th I think we drove in and then they said, you can't come in here. And they said, oh, sorry, we'll drive out again. And I think we got the, this is the shot. That's, oh, that's Alan out. Bedell yes. coming out of that of Buckingham Palace. And that's for real. Gosh. And you would never get that now. Wow. That's for sure. This is literally incriminating evidence. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I was quite pleased to get that. Yeah, very good. Um, this is her goodbye. So we sort of wanted to Otley to end up where he started. That was the. Mm. Are we meant to feel anger? Just talking about the scene that's just been. Are we meant to feel angry that this the, the, that he's being knighted, that he's being accepted into this these upper echelons of society? I think it, there's a certain irony. Yes, mm. that 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 you know, the bugger got away with it. Yeah. And and. and well, he's almost being rewarded for it. Yes, yes. Yes. I mean. Yeah. Well, not for that one action, but you no. know, for whatever, for for his position and for mm. services to, whether they're going to kick him upstairs, I, you know, one doesn't know. No. Um, but yes, here we are back where we started, which I think is feels right to Absolutely. me. Absolutely. And this not getting the girl feels very, you know, it, it, it's the yeah. it's the counterpoint, isn't it, to the yeah the fact that they sort of did for they, a bit. They belong in different worlds. Yes. And yeah. He's he's had a brief. Uh, a brief encounter with hers, and we're yeah. absolutely, literally, where we started absolutely. at the beginning. Yeah. Yes. This is so he's going to go back to Fiona Lewis, who obviously yeah. fancies him. Indeed, it's uh, nothing subtle about that. No. It really is fascinating to look um, to look at all this location stuff. You know, if you if you're familiar with the London of now. 
Because as, you, as I think you said a little bit earlier, this hasn't changed a great deal. No, the, the Portobello really looks essentially the same. You know, the, the cars have changed a bit, but not yeah. all that much. No. And so they're literally we're at the end and we've yeah. got uh, back where we started. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk us through your film. It's, it's been, been a joy. Enjoyable. It's been fun to see it again. Good. And um, very I'm pleased. very fond of it. Thank you. Oh, 